Everybody, welcome to another Midas Letter Daily. It is the middle of the year, Edward. We look back in the rear view at the where first did half. It, where did it go? We're looking down the hill into the second half of the year. The days are getting shorter already. Yes. So summer's just yes. getting started. Yes. And uh, the market continues its uh, deterioration, we'll call it. It's destruction, disintegration. Let's start with that, disintegration. It's uh, the Fed's, uh, you know, the it's shrinking. It's shrinking, yes, it's contracted. They're, they're, they're trying to reduce the money supply. Well, and as we have been saying for, I don't know, 30 decades or so, the- No, if it's, the, we've been talking about a market top last November well, into December. And, the and theory, we watch those bonds all the time. Yeah, and the idea that the market pricing does not reflect the value of the companies traded on it. It reflects the quantity of the quantitative easing and the zero interest rate policy that makes it possible for all companies to borrow money at almost zero cost. So this is the thing. Those have been withdrawn. Now the Fed is The seeking. chickens have come home to roost. You can't. The chickens now you're, are back. You go to, you go to pay your mortgage payments doubled. It's doubled. The price of gas is doubled. If everything's doubled, where are they going to get the money to buy their beer? So today on the show, we have a few guests for you. Um, Mark Bristow is the CEO of Barrick Gold Corps, and he's joining us for a long conversation about gold. You know, he's running a, a very big gold producer. Yes. Gary Yeoman is joining us for an update on Voxter Analytics, which, as you know, has reported outstanding financial data, yet has halved in value from its high this year. Valuations, when rates go up, valuations go down. So all of these guests are coming up. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Make sure you never miss a show by subscribing to our YouTube channel and clicking on the little notifications bell. If you're interested in getting monthly actionable investment ideas in the cannabis space to your inbox, subscribe to the newsletter at MidasLetter.com. Now we have audience questions. Lovely Stocks asks, is Bitcoin really in trouble as it, fall, as it fails to stay above $20,000 or are we due for a bounce from a technical perspective? Well, I thought, I thought we saw the bounce already. It was down to 18 and back to 21. And now it's back to 18. If it fails here, it's going to drift lower. Emil Rogers wants to know, what are your expectations for Q2 earnings reports coming in a few weeks? They will be disappointing. They, it, they will, there'll be some neg more negative surprises. Yep. Uh, the ship hasn't been righted. Right. There's not, there's no reason for optimism. Not yet. Yes. Not yet at all. MJ wants to know, are you shorting stocks or holding cash as markets continue to drop? Uh, if I, if I was, uh, if I ran a fund, I'd be shorting stocks. I'm, uh, I'm holding cash. Yeah. 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 If I, I actually, I, actually, I'm waiting for the markets uh, to demonstrates, well, actually what I'm waiting for is the July meeting of the Fed. If the Fed does in fact raise 75 basis points, I will be look to placing some short bets ahead of that news, is what I am looking at yeah. doing. Otherwise, I'm not deploying any long capital except in private opportunities that have no contemplation of going public anytime soon. And the reason for that is because they're long opportunities. It's, it's, in the as long as the NASDAQ remains in bear market territory, I, you know, more than a 20% correction, I would suggest that prudence is... Do you know, nothing. Just sit back. Short it. Wait till it gets out. If it, while it's still there... Go get some popcorn. Get ready, for, <laughs> get ready for the next half of the year. Okay, Market Lux, there's a handle, wants to know, are prices of oil going to continue to rise with OPEC missing oil production targets? Uh, you know, they're talking now that Saudi's got extra. Uh, another one of the companies has extra. Countries. Demand. Middle Eastern countries. Which one? So, two of them. Saudi and UAE both said that they have a little extra capacity they could toy with. Massage up? Let's, be, let, let's massage right. this opportunity. Yeah. 
Well, so the prices of oil are going to continue okay, to so rise. Generally, I think they are going to continue to rise. Okay, well, I'll say this. Yesterday, the oil was knocking on 114. And they came out with the energy inventory numbers. And there was an unexpected rise in, in gasoline supplies. And we saw oil drop to 105. It's, that's a $9 drop. That's, yeah. that's 8%. Significant. That's 8% yeah. in a day. Yeah. A day. Yeah. So, market lux, uh, the prices of oil continuing to rise because of supply side misses is definitely going to be offset with the, the demand destruction as a result of global weakness economically. So those two forces are going to compete in the marketplace and um, you'd, I'm not long oil and I'm not short you, oil. You, you know what one of the top analysts, uh, the oil Eric Nuttall. There's two things said. One was that it's never looked more bullish for, su for supply because dwindling whatever. And then he, but then someone said it's never been more cloudy in terms of demand because the world's slowing down so fast. Yeah. There, so there's a competing thing, and I'm not saying, I think, I think oil's going lower first. Yeah. Okay. Jan Summer wants to know, if the Fed has everything under control, <laughs> sorry, Jan, why is the market reacting the way it is if the stock market is truly a leading indicator? Well, Jan, sounds like you suffer from uh, undue optimism. If no, you think I, the Fed the, has things under control because they've raised well, rates, yeah, no, they, the Fed does not have anything under control except the power to raise rates and generate quantitative easing. So until they do that, there will be, until they reverse course on rate rises and coincide that with increased monetary and then they haven't liquidity even production, started running off the balance there's sheet. There's not yet. going to be any reversal in the general market directions. So the stock market is the leading indicator of, of risk appetite and investment in the world. So if the market continues to sell off, that tells you that there's a low level of confidence in the Fed's ability to bring anything under control. That's the bottom line. You know, they tried to tweak this and they, they really waited too long to start tightening. And now they've got this freight train or runaway train they're trying to slow it down, and they're going to slow it down so much, they're going to have to start feeding it coal again. Austin Kohler wants to know, what are the most oversold industries, and does the discount create value to invest? And does the discount create value to invest? What are the most oversold industries? Well, if you, if you said industries, I would say, I, I don't know in terms of industry. Uh, I noticed the uh, chip makers have been hit pretty hard. You know, but but they've all been hit hard. Like yeah. it's not like you know you, you don't have to cherry pick here. I mean, well, I would say if just looking at the three major indices, S and P is the biggest of right. the big. Yeah. So technology, technology. Nasdaq been, is tech. Yeah. And the Dow is industrial. So tech has suffered the biggest loss. So the tech sector is the most oversold, just on a purely nominal basis. Looking but at but still may be the most overvalued. Well, exactly. That's you know, just it. And can get more oversold. Yes. So, yeah. So, uh, tech is the most oversold. Does the discount create value? No, absolutely not. The discount creates opportunity to short the hell out of it. I, I and would ride say it even lower. W w watch uh, Amazon. If Amazon can't hold 100 here in the next week or so and starts getting under 100 because it did a big s split. Yeah. I don't think that would be good. No. I think because Amazon is in, you know, everybody. Oh, unless you're short. Well, in this case, it would be great. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Nicholas Bell, should I buy bonds now or wait for higher rates? Well, I would buy now. Or well, if you? rates really go, I think, I, I kind of think you, you'd buy, I, I don't think rates are going much higher. I really think they've slowed the demand down here. It's trick. It's coming to a, down to a trickle. And uh, you got to be careful. Mm-hmm. Do you agree, or J, Joe M asks, do you agree that the VIX has to hit at least 45 peak fear historically before we see a true market bottom? First of all, Joe M, I'm gonna correct you on 45 being the peak in the VIX. Historically, the peak in 2008 was 80. 80, I think. Yes, yeah. yes. And it must have really came off hard, but, but that's yeah. what we're saying. That was the worst quarter. Yeah, if, if, the, if the VIX hits 80, uh, that would demonstrate, that would imply the imminent fall of some major institutions simultaneously. And that's what happened. 
well, that is what happened. So 45, it can easily blow through 45 and not suffer a major catastrophic collapse in confidence. In fact, let's pull up that VIX chart. So currently sitting at 28.16, so touched 18, sorry, touched 53.54 in March of 2020. So that's much higher than the 45 that you right. were suggesting. Yeah. And then if we go all the way back here to 2008. October, oh, sorry, October 2008 was only 60. So okay. not 80, as okay. we said. But uh, yeah. Well, go back to 2000. Well, this is 2000 right here. No, 2000. This is 2000 right here. Oh, okay. Okay, so that was the all time peak. Yeah, this is the highest <clears throat> it's ever been since they started measuring. So 59.89. You know, it looks, it does look, if I'm just sitting back here, it looks like more volatility. It looks, these charts where the lows here, you keep getting this, higher, huh? the, the lows keep getting higher, Yeah. like there, see, low, now a little higher, a little higher, a little higher, a little higher. Yeah. They get washed out there, and it, you know, it, it has a rounding appearance there. We may be, if this thing starts heading this way, up into this range, that's when you got to start. Well, you got to take it a day at a time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so back to the audience questions here. But but the, the fact that the interest rate's now below three. So the VIX hitting 45, and let's not forget that the VIX is looking backwards. It's not looking forwards. The VIX is looking back at and using market performance to determine the sentiment. So VIX hitting 45 would suggest that we just had a major drop in the market and it might or might not be expected to continue. So the VIX is not really a great indicator of a market bottom in my view. It's more a rear view look in the mirror. I don't know. When, when, this, when the VIX goes ballistic, you know, when, when it's, it's a puke up thing. Like these major spikes, to these higher, higher levels. Those are puke up points. If you're enjoying the show, subscribe to Midas Letter on YouTube so you stay up to date on everything investment. You know, the 10-year the rate got to 352. Yes. And it's now at 351. Yes. Now 298. Well, so what is that telling us, Edward? Well, it's telling Let's us. pull up the 10-year chart. Here we go. We'll go oh, full screen. Oh, whoa. Okay, see? Edward, here's your little okay, driving so, path. So there you go. So you, this, this here yes. is now lower than this. This means now that there's a bit of maybe a bit of a violation, but a that's violation. very steep. You, you know, we may get some bouncing up and down here, but this looks like this top may be a major top now. Yeah. Which would mean that maybe we've seen it, the peak in interest rates. Really? Right here. Here. And, you know, it tried it again, failed a bit. Down here, this trend is Here's what's important to note, is that from this level here, 15,000, that's 10,000, 14,000. So this massive run up from 15 to 20, from 10 to 20,000 basically happened using Tether. And there's a ongoing investigation by the Department of Justice and the SEC suggesting that Tether didn't have the US dollars backing it during this run up. And what they were in fact doing was minting tethers based on how much Bitcoin they had. So they were buying a Bitcoin using tether and then using the Bitcoin to justify minting more tether because their balance of Bitcoin had gone up. But it was completely based on a fraud because it was supposed to be backed by US dollar assets. So there's a high degree of fraudulent activity in here where Tether, which is not restricted to only 21 million ever being made, was basically baffed out. That, I think, is the biggest threat to this, this area in here. And what's going to take it out, uh, and I think what's going to catalyze that takeout is, as the S&P, NASDAQ, and Dow move lower, then we're going to see down here between below 15,000 for sure, and 10,000 is arguably the next possible level of support. Though, you are saying, Edward, that there is a technical feature of this chart that suggests that if it breaches below 15,000, that it, 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 it's going to drop fast. It's going to go up, lights out, Marianne. 
Well, you, you know what? There's a lot of symmetry in these things. And, you, you know, we saw a double top, double top. And then we got the breakdown here. We got, you know, it wasn't the other day. It was at 18 and change. And it rallied back to 21. But right back to 18 again. You get the feeling. You got to be thinking if you're a big, big owner here, and maybe you got in lucky and, and around the 30 level. Yes. How would you be feeling? Like, you think, why am I in this? Yeah. Why don't I own gold? Next up is a very special guest. Mark Bristow is the CEO of Barrett Gold Corp, the world's largest mining company of gold by attributable ounces, as he will explain here. My next guest is Mark Bristow. He is the CEO of Barrett Gold Corp. Mark, welcome. Thank you, uh, James. Nice to be here. Mark, let's, uh, let's talk a bit about Barrett Gold and its role in the global financial system, particularly in the global gold mining system. Uh, Barrick has been at various times the largest gold mining company in the world, the most profitable gold mining company in the world, and is now many times over the largest company in the world, except it has for now ceded the role of the largest gold company in terms of ounces uh, attributed to Newmont Gold, whereas it retains the leadership role for ounces produced because, you, as you mentioned earlier, you produce ounces for other companies. So I'm curious as to how does Barrick view itself in the gold mining system going forward into the future in terms of how much more production is possible? Is peak gold arrived? Uh, yes, uh, peak gold has arrived, um, and that's what drove the merger with Rand Gold, and that is quality assets. So it's always been the case in my career. If you if you go back to Rand Gold, we built a business focused on uh, projects that would be started with more than a million ounces. Then three years, as we grew and and the importance of real returns. You know, we look for 15% returns today at $1,200 long-term gold price. And and we got Rand Gold to a, a, a perfect valuation. And it was in 2015 we started looking around because remember 2015, um, the, the gold price went really far down and we were engaged with all the majors to talk to them because we had cash and everyone had blown their brains out in the last big bull market, you know, after the, you know, 20 from 2011 to 2013 with super premium deals. And the thing that attracted uh, us together with Barrick is together we dominated the best assets in the, in the industry. So if we define a tier one asset and, and, and many people have, um, corrupted my definition of a tier one asset, but a tier one asset is 500,000 ounces of product, potential production for more than 10 years in the lower half of a cost curve. And a copper, it needs, and so you need 7 million ounces. In copper, it's 5 million uh, uh, tons of copper, uh, that give a 15% IRR at 275 dollars an ounce, um, and 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 so that so those are tier one assets. If you look at gold specifically, um, Barrick has six out of the top twelve, and so ultimately, in the longer term, you have to be the best, and it's about value. You know, I've always said. Our vision is to become the most valued gold company or gold copper company in the world. Not valuable, valued, not the biggest. And why do we say valued? Because we want people to want to work for us. You know, to be a modern gold or mining company today, you have to be accepted by future generations. We also want host countries wanting us to invest in their country because they know we are strong, reliable partners that share the benefits of their of their national assets. And finally, we want fund managers to own us, not to trade us. So that means you are valued in that concept of a public company. To do that, you've got to be 
you have to have a strong license to operate with all those various stakeholders. But, but, but more importantly, you need to be able to be relevant in the market as a public market. And the gold industry was getting smaller and smaller in, in f- size. And so to keep growing, as you talk about peak gold, to keep growing in peak gold, and you look at it, all the big undeveloped assets in the world that are profitable, potentially profitable, and have golden, have as much copper or more. And copper, in my mind, is the most strategic metal we've, we have on the, this planet. Because if you believe that we have to do all this investment for clean energy, and we've got to transport it from where we can get renewables to where the big industrial uh, sites are, we need copper. And you can't replace it. And it comes with gold. It's the same process, same geological systems that form it. And it comes in big chunks. And so we said you have any company that wants to be sustainable and sustainably possible, pro- profitable has to invest in high quality copper and gold assets. And of course, we're still a gold company. But Barrick has always had about 20% copper its copper hasn't been that profitable today it's very profitable and so that's the that's the concept and so and and it's a lot and and you know uh, james the the thing that i and it's a great opportunity to say this when we did the merger with rangold we were the first to lead this consolidation we paid nothing no premium because the 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 logic of the transaction had entrenched in it the value. And we delivered that value. We've delivered it in spades. Which jurisdictions is Barrick most excited about in terms of future gold production? We are invested as Barrick in all the main gold regions, belts uh, in the world, except for the Russian ones. Um, And that's not because of what's happening now. It's because Russian mining has never given you the right to own and develop your mines. So you were, you were always part of government's, you know, sort of decision making. And so when you look at that and, and the one that, uh, so Nevada, Nevada is by far the most exciting place. You know, when you, when you want to hunt elephants, you go to elephant country. Um, and, and then of course, uh, Africa has been very good for us because it produces it's it's badly it's been badly explored it's still got lots of prospectivity and you've got the you know the the the, the most prolific delivery of new discoveries is west africa if you look back in the last two decades um canada is a place where it's the friend you know along with parts of australia that's the friendliest mining jurisdictions in 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 the world and then the emerging one, which we're super excited about, is Indonesia. I mean, not Indonesia, Southern Asia. And, of course, Indonesia has got some bruises of deposits, all gold, copper, you know. Um, and, and as you know, um, Pakistan, the, uh, the Rika Dick project that we're now in the final stages of securing, it's been a long asset, uh, a barrack asset, gone through many challenging times, but it's a world-class asset. And what, again, we've been able to unlock it because what we've delivered to the Pakistan government and more importantly, the Paluchi uh, province is a par- real partnership structure where the Baluch uh, people will benefit, they'll own 25% of the equity of Rikadik and they it's all funded. Right. I've always said uh, in mining, if you want to be world class, you have to be global because that's the way you manage your risk. Um, because the world is so dynamic, uh, you know, it's so instant. You can go from 100 to zero in a nanosecond. Um, and you've got to have that spread out, you know, ability to manage that risk profile because. And, and Barrick is in a perfect, uh, you know, we, I, th- I think Barrick needs to be double the size in value, not in production. Um, 
and but you know we're not going to build it by doing m and a and thinking that the banker's models will stay relevant. You know you build long term value through a well disciplined allocation of capital where you're investing for value sure okay, and finally mark i'm going to throw i'm going to lob one out of left field uh, what is the likelihood and what would it take for us to see five thousand dollar gold? Well, I think uh, if you listen to the G7 summit, there are a lot of very important politicians working really hard to get gold to 5,000. So that's okay. That's very succinct. <laughs> awesome, Mark. Mark, I, uh, I really appreciate your time. I so enjoyed our conversation, and I can't wait to do it again, I hope, at some point in the future, hopefully before gold's 5,000. But if it rushes to 5,000, on that date, I'll make a point of reaching out again. Yeah, thank you, James. It's, it, I must say, it's been a pleasure talking to you, and, and any time. We will do this again. Fantastic. Look forward to it. Me too. Thank you, Mark. Bye for now. So there's a chart of Barrett Gold, obviously very closely correlated to the price of gold, which has been down. But if you want to own a gold company with exposure to the future upside, Barrick is obviously the one to consider. So let's talk about gold then yeah. for a second, shall we? I mean, let's start off this gold conversation with this TikTok I watch. Uganda have just discovered 31 million metric tons of gold. This equates to approximately about $12 trillion worth of gold. The market cap of gold currently is $11 trillion, meaning that the market cap theoretically of gold has just doubled overnight. So what does this mean? Theoretically, if you're looking at supply and demand... That so we'll just stop it right there. Yeah, yeah. And let's start to point out the tremendous disinformation that this video represents. First of all, uh, you're saying that She's saying that the market cap for gold is $11 trillion. Where'd she get that number? And well, what's she referring to? They're re she's referring to all the gold that's out there, that's known to be out there. Including the jewelry? Uh, because I don't see how anybody could have an accurate measurement well, of that. Well, you know. Yeah. So, bottom line is... But there's, an, there's always been a market cap for gold. Yeah. Okay, like they say that all the gold that's ever been produced can fit in two... Olympic size swimming pools or something like that. Yeah. It's not that big of a thing. Anyway. Anyways, and so let's talk about this news item. And I use the term news very loosely. Uh, let's use Mining Review Africa's version. So Uganda announced that it had discovered 31 million metric tons of gold waiting to be mined in the country. Do you, does anybody really need to add waiting to be mined to the discovery? Well, yeah, because you discovered it in the ground, and, it's just and now waiting. it's waiting to be mined. Whereas the other gold deposits, they're not waiting to be mined. They're trying to stay put. Anyways, this is by the Uganda Investment Authority, and I'm how, not... How did they find this uh, gold? Well, where's the geologist? Where's the qualified person? No geologist on this one? No geologist. You don't need it. They said it's a survey. Solid gold. It's a survey of the guys in the field. Do you guys think there's any gold here? There's yes, surveys. we do. They've done surveys? They, uh, well, that's what it's based on is a survey. Oh. So they're saying. Survey says. Yeah. Now, it's, uh, it's, it's basically, this should be yeah. taken with less than one grain of salt. This should be categorized yeah. for what it is, complete and utter bullshit. Yeah, yeah. There is no geological survey. I wonder if somebody's desperate in the crypto world to get the price up so they're starting well, to conjure up stories. Well, but listen to this. According to Mining Review Africa, a spokesperson from the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development Uganda, Solomon Muta, said that these reports are aimed at attracting gold miners and investors in the crypto sector. <laughs> So, so this, so this, that's just the Jaws music. Bro. Yeah. So this fake news is is announced by the Minister of Energy and Mineral Development. Is we've issued these reports strictly to attract investors into and the gold sector and the crypto sector. <laughs> it doesn't get any better. You want to call? People. You want to? You want to call out for your mommy? Next up, Gary Yeoman. Uh, executive chairman of Voxer Analytics joins us to give us an update on Voxer. Here he is. 
Joining us again is Gary Yeoman, Executive Chairman of Boxster Analytics Core Trading on the TSX Venture under the symbol VXTR and in the United States under the symbol VXTRF. Gary, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure, Gary. Uh, Gary, I wanted to sort of touch base with you and get an overview of some of the things we saw happening, some of the moves Voxter has been making. But first, let's just walk through the financials, the most recent first quarter of 2022, because it struck me that despite the absence of a profit, that there was certainly a direction underway that was indicative of a future profit. And so there was a lot of uh, anticipation last year of, uh, you know, the first quarter of 2022 being the breakout quarter, which, you know, in on one sense happened because triple digit year on year growth certainly qualifies as a breakout in some respects, but it didn't have the effect on the share price that one might have expected. And obviously that's in part due to the market conditions overall globally. But uh, how did you feel about the market response to your financials? I, I really didn't have a lot of expectation to be, to be quite candid with you. Um, I think that there's still a lot of work that we need to do uh, for people to you know, truly understand who Boxer is and what we're doing. Um, there's been a, a major transformation from, you know, a boots on the ground company to a data and software as a service company, which we are, you know, we are rolling that out very effectively, you know, in, in, in our opinion. And so we think that with the advent of us continuing to grow revenues and we expect to be uh, profitable in the last half of this year, not the first two quarters. The revenue is, you know, the 40 million a quarter is kind of consistent, but you have to imagine that we're rolling out um, basically four new platforms um, as we speak, and they've been paid for, right, um, internally, and we've expensed this, but we've rolled out a, a new digitized valuation piece where we can you know, we can certainly do a valuation, fully insured, uh, wrapped around and turn it around in 72 hour, uh, hours for less than $200. And depending upon how, um, you know, how significant that valuation is, we can even do it as little as $50. So, I mean, you know, that's a major difference from what you're seeing in the marketplace where typical AMCs are a thousand bucks in, in 20 days. So that uh, digitization and that, and. And what we're accompanying with that, which is really interesting, is that we built this 3,500 data set, you know, quality control tool, so that we can review everything about that appraisal in seconds. But we look at all the data sets that are in there and find out if there's, you know, key uh, data points that are missing. And we also review the valuations where you look at comparables and, you know, make sure that they stack up to, uh, our valuation stacks up to similar properties, you know, in the area. So. The, the QC with the insurance wrap around it separates us. And so that's all proprietary to us. So we're rolling that out in the third quarter of this year. And that'll be, um, we, we think, you know, there's going to be a significant uptake that in the secondary markets, right? In the, you know, where capital markets are, you know, where pe people are buying and selling mortgage portfolios are going to need, you know, that kind of support. Um, we know that the advent of our property tax uh, platform, the uh, real property tax analytics, um, we'll be rolling out in the uh, third quarter as well. And again, we're tackling um, not only the capital market side, but you know all of the lenders. We just feel that re they really need to know as fiduciaries whether the taxes that they're paying on behalf of the mortgagees, whether it's too high, too low, by how much, they can't be paying these taxes without some kind of review, and that's their legal obligation. So we have that tool that's not offered anywhere in the marketplace. Uh, we'll providing be providing that sorry in the third quarter as well to the. Uh, rate payers themselves directly through a social media blitz that we're doing and we'll also be uh, providing it as a quality control tool to the uh, county so that rollout will be significant for us um, uh, a third piece is on our title our attorney opinion letter which we've talked about you know i've, I've said um, 
previous meetings with you that this is the first time in 74 years that, um, that Fannie and the Federal Housing Financing Authority have changed their policy um, to allow attorney opinion letters. They vetted all aspects of it, uh, including the viability of the insurance, which we believe is stronger than the current platform that is offered right now. And so we're in pilot projects right now. Um, we haven't announced them because we're precluded from saying who they are. I just say that they're brand name significant lenders. And so the advent of the rollout of that um, is important. So that's, you know, you got title, you know, uh, opinion letters, you got, um, the, you know, the valuation uh, uh, product digitized. Uh, a third uh, platform that we're rolling out right now is our asset management piece. And that's going to be significant. Can you imagine that you're sitting there with your phone and you can pick up a value um, on your property, you know, 24 seven from your phone from us. And then with that, you also have the capabilities that if you want your insurance reviewed every year, we'll provide you competitive bids uh, from brand noted insurance companies. If you're buying a selling house, we'll give you the best lender or sorry, the best broker and the best agent. Uh, if your you know, mortgage is coming due, we'll provide you with the best you know, competitive rates on the lending capabilities. And we'll even transcend that down for, to grass cutting, snow removal, pest control, gardeners, landscaping, you know, et cetera. And so what we're providing is a, a fully, um, you know, uh, independent database, uh, private digitized database, private ledger, that, uh, that people will be able to manage their assets. So we're gonna be representing major lenders and high net worth uh, wealth companies where people can put those, those assets in there and have those assets looked after. Uh, we'll white label that in the name of whether it's a BMO wealth or a, you know, you can go right on down to the private, you know, wealth companies. And it'll put it be in their name, white label it. But to be able to manage those assets, to mitigate elderly fraud, which is a big problem in today's society, um, and to be able to um, save, you know, households money is a big, big deal. And so again, that's rolling out in the third quarter of this year as well. So we spent a lot of money, as you can see, by by virtue of us not, you know, being profitable in the, in the first and. You know, I'm going to suggest to you in the second quarters, we believe that we should be break even, maybe making a bit of money in the third, and then we think we're going to have a very, um, you know, um, strong fourth quarter and beyond. So mm -hmm. we're, we're quite happy about our future uh, to be a emerging technology, data technology, software as a service company, and to be profitable. You'd almost think that's an oxymoron, but that will happen to us in 2022. I look at the platform in its entirety now with these three different, four different components, and uh, I wonder why all of the major brand name lenders don't use Voxter as their platform. It's, it's simple. We believe they will. All right, but this is a, a new project, and so in concert with uh, the you know the Fannies of the world, we agreed that we would start off with four, and use them as a pilot, get all the kinks out, which we haven't found any to date, but get them out. Uh, make sure that everything is is performing as depicted, and and then you know you know the latter half of the third quarter and the fourth is just continuing the momentum to board people on. Also, in the financials, it was disclosed that ninety percent of your business is U.S. based, is and the rest, I guess, is Canada. Mm -hmm. And do you see that ratio maintaining that same sort of split? It's the same ratio as how many properties are in the U.S. versus how many properties in Canada. What is the population of the U.S. to Canada? You're always at kind of 10, we're always 10%, you know, yeah. in and around that anyway. So we believe that we fairly represent Canada as well as the U.S. It's just, you know, it's just a matter of opportunities. So at this point in the U.S. market, in terms of addressable market for Voxter, what percentage of the addressable market would you say that you've got at this point? I don't have that many decimals uh, with zeros in front to explain. <laughs> We've right. got great growth opportunities. This is another way of you know, responding to that question. There are enormous growth opportunities. Is there an expectation that the uptake on the part of the market is going to happen rapidly or slowly? I think slowly for the next couple quarters um, because there has to be adaption into new platforms yeah and then i think that you're going to see more momentum in the fourth quarter and then i think you're going to have strong momentum in 2023 and beyond 
And so this slow uptake and adoption, is that going to be an opportunity for competitors to roll out a platform that might be a competitor for Voxter? We've been working on a lot of these projects for over three years. And so um, how do they kind of move at lightning speed? Now, you know, on the attorney opinion, I mean, we do have a patent on it. And we do have exclusivity on the insurance companies that are provided. So if you go to an insurance company and go through the whole actuarial process to, you know, roll out a new uh, type of insurance policy, it takes time. I mean, no one is doing it overnight. So we think first mover advantage in all aspects, whether it's in our title, whether it's in our tax. Gary, that's a great update. We're going to leave it there for now. We'll come back to you in due course. Thank you for your time today. Thanks for having me. You bet. So Voxer Analytics obviously suffering the slings and arrows of a bear market in which it finds itself embroiled despite outstanding financial reporting. Still not profitable. Now looking for profitability at Q2 2023, as, as he says. And, uh, you know, that's just one that's going to be one of the ones to rebound heavily when the market turns come November. Yeah, okay, there's my there prediction. you have it. Yes, anyway, so... Um, well, yeah, look, at the, lots, lots of things going on. And just so we know, here we are, six months out in the market. At the end of the day, we're almost at the market lows. Yeah. At, at, at for the say the Nasdaq, which is down a third. A, well, a what good do you mean third. at the market lows? Market lows uh, uh, to date. For, uh, the market lows from the high. The high being last November, December. Yeah. So the high was one, two, three, four, five, six months ago. Yeah. So that's right. So basically, year to date. Da that's why it's been the worst fucking six months right. since 1970. Right. And, uh, you know, and that makes All you right. think, well, wait a minute. Now, so you know, it can't be many guys having a good time right now. No. You so know? year to date, the S&P is down 21%, which by every definition of bear market, the oh. S&P is in a bear market. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think the Dow, the Dow Jones not, Industrial Average may not be. is down 15.9%. So that's getting close so that, to bear you know, market you know what? You know, when money, when people get scared, money goes into things like Coca-Cola. Okay, but what about NASDAQ? Well, NASDAQ's NASDAQ down, down a third, 33. 33%. You 33 and a third economic growth. Economic growth economic no economic longer growth. happening. Economic. So, yeah, so basically all the markets are in bear market territory. Let's look at our poultry little J. Uh, S&P TSX Venture Composite, which is basically the Canadian Mining Index. Wow. And look at this poor how, how What's the time frame here? Always tell me the time frame, Okay, sir. so this is November 2022 okay. up here. Okay, so, so November 2021. Sorry, November 2021, yeah. yeah. So that counts yeah. as the most recent all -time high. All-time high. No, the all-time high was actually way back here. Oh, my God. In 2000 and, oh, it's not letting us go back yeah, all yeah. the way. So it would be- You have to go all. 2007? No. It's 2000, yeah, 2007. You are right, Edward. 3352. Yeah, I remember that. In April. Yeah, but we haven't seen that. We had another high in uh, March of 26. And here's the funny thing is this reversal happened at the PDAC in March 2011. Yeah, or I remember that. I remember that bounce. See, but you see what happens. You get that, that almost perfect plunge. Then you get a fall back and forth, but not quite as high as where it started from. And then... It, it's an ugly looking chart, I gotta be honest with you. Yeah. Especially if you're sitting over here thinking, how's this gonna get back up there? Well, but why this chart should really be considered, especially in the context of this market where everything is down, real estate, energy, food, uh, food prices are not down, but agricultural commodities are down. There's, the, the demand, they're really killing demand here. They, and if they can't see, they're killing it a little faster. Well, you can't kill demand for food, though, can no, you? No, no, no. I'm saying demand for everything else. So the, what, this, what <clears throat> needs to be considered here is this is also the index of global mining investment on, in exploration. That's the TSX venture. That's right. So yeah. what this is telling you is that investment in mining exploration since 2014 has been uniformly low. Yeah. And it, has, it is going to drop off in direct proportion to this chart. So given the fact that commodities, uh, mineral commodities are being produced at lower and lower grades and in shorter, shorter supply, and yep. there's no investment in exploration, and there's no investment in new mine supply from the majors, 
we are heading for a major, a major supply side crunch in across all metals. And you know, you, you, you talk about oil, it, it, the big, mine, big oil companies don't want to invest. They want to they give out the money back to the show. We're, we're making commodities well, scarcer and here. scarcer. There's a one year chart. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, here, if you want to make yeah, some yeah, gestures just gonna say, at the screen, look at that. this. This is the, the uh, Russian war, all this stuff, but you get a nice trend line here, then it ex explodes when the, the invasion of the Ukraine took place. And that was a blow off top up until now. Now, this trend here, I can't make a sideways line. That trend is be just breached yesterday and today. So it's, it, it seems to be rolling a bit. Look, anything can happen. I mean, if... Well, we know for a fact that the G7 is uniformly interested in, in a lower oil price. They want now to spend money to find more oil and gas. Well, and we know for a fact that the 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 sentiment coming out of the NATO meeting in Brussels is that Joe Biden has said that Zelensky needs to rethink his definition of victory in the context of the Ukraine-Russia war. Obviously, he the said pressure that. he did. The pressure is mounting on uh, the Russians and Zelensky to come to some sort of resolution because the G7 wants the Russian oil inventory in the global market to help in the fight against inflation. Which, absent that, it's not going to be very fightable. It's not going to be winnable. So this is the great thing. Now, so we've got the, the major indices are all down, call it 20 to 30 percent, 16 to 20 percent. And oil prices are still too high to be considered, you know, not impacting no, prices. You, look, there, there again, you, if you see oil, I think, break 100 and stay below 100 and start you know, you'll, you'll be able to tell, but we've had a hell of a run and all good things come to an end. But, you know, they say oil could go to 175 on fundamentals and yet the demand in the world seems to be starting to be destroyed. Tip for now. Yeah, well, that's because rates are high and yeah. oil is high. Well, so we're going, the U.S. is going into midterms in November. The pressure is going to be on from the Democratic front for Jerome Powell to come up with a solution to put the, put, the, put the lift back in the step of the markets, which can only happen with more quantitative easing you think, and lower interest well, rates. Well, that's why you got to watch that interest rate. You well, gotta, so this is, this is what I'm saying, is that we have only to wait till September before the Fed steps in and reverses course due to pressure from the political front. The Republicans... Is that the are, next time they meet? Or no, they, they meet, they meet uh, July. Yeah, in July, but the Fed, the, everything's priced into what's coming out of July, which is unanimously another seventy-five, 75. basis points. Yeah, and that'll take it to what? So okay. there's there's the Fed funds rate seven point seven seven. July they're supposed to raise it to another seventy-five basis points. We'll put it at one point two seven. The price of gold since this this silly announcement came out, uh, gold you know, has basically gone down. Now, yeah, it's been drifting lower because rates have been firm, but rates are shitty today. I, yeah, look, I, I can't believe anybody pays any attention to that shit. No, <laughs> no doubt, eh? Like, who the hell's, yeah. Well, it's all somebody bullshit. does. She obviously well, does because she wants her one Bitcoin yeah. to go back to. It's the pretext for so much. Anyways, there's our show for this Friday. Okay. We hope you have a massively Bow, happy wow. Canada Bow, Day. Wow. Have a happily massive, massively happy 4th of July, despite the ugly markets. And we'll see you on the other side of the long weekends. Ciao for now. Ciao for now.